Welcome to Environmental Fridays. It is personal, season three. This season will be featuring 12 episodes with 12 guest speakers from Barbados, Delaware, Grenada, Illinois, Kansas, Michigan, St. Lucia, Trinidad, Washington, and Virginia. Now here's our host, Dr. Desmond Hartwell Murray. And this week's guest co-host, Claude J. Douglas. And this week's guest speaker, Dr. Jody Daniel. So thank you all. Welcome to, for coming. Uh, welcome to Environmental Fridays. It is personal season three. Today we have episode five and it's coming to us live and direct from Grenada. So um, today, we are going to highlight, I believe, in, um, our, in the lecture today, a uh, conversation on conservation and development. This picture that you're looking at here with the nice rainbow, the water, clouds, all of that, that's Grand Anne's. I was there this uh, past summer, took some pictures. This one is one of them. And um, okay, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. All right, is everyone seeing the screen? Are you guys seeing my screen? Yes. Yes, okay, good. So thank you all, welcome to, for coming. Uh, welcome to Environmental Fridays. It is personal season three. Today we have episode five and it's coming to us live and direct from Grenada. So um, today we are gonna highlight, I believe in, um, our, in the lecture today, a conversation on conservation and development. This picture that you're looking at here with the nice rainbow, the water, clouds, all of that, that's Grand Anne's. I was there this uh, past summer, took some pictures. This one is one of them. And um, it's one of the most beautiful beaches, I think, in the world. I spent lots of hours in that beach this summer. And um, one of the things that this uh, beach um, illustrates, I believe, is deals with this intersection between conservation and development. And as a way to get into this conversation this morning, I'm gonna play a video from 2018, I believe, that was posted on YouTube. And so let me get that going. Again, make sure, uh, let me know if you're not seeing this or hearing it. The, the construction fence that was supposed to state that is to protect the people from the beach and whatever construction they're going to be doing going to be with the inside. And they say that the fence is going to be temporary. When they, when they finish the construction, they're going to be removed. But at this point in time right now, how it's looking, we see they open up the fence at certain places and walls coming out. And these walls coming straight across the beach. So eventually nobody can, I mean, you can't pass. Grenadians, have always prided themselves on the fact that all of our beaches, wherever you would find a beach in Grenada, it's open to the public. Nobody could own it. You go there wherever you find a beach and enjoy yourself. One thing I think we should is making it and see. We don't have to they listen to anybody. On the beach. We all know what the law says about building. It has to, you have to identify the high water mark. 
It is usually where the sand ends and the, um, and the grass begins. And then you still have another number of feet beyond that before you could start to build, or start to own. And to see that we have a, a project that has come right to the high water mark, first of all, and then to further encroach with walls into the sand. It, I mean, it, it, it is a very worrisome development. Certain so, you can cast like a before. You can hold your monk a jacks like fish like you used to hold before, you know what I mean? That's mm -hmm. why you have bumpy line and bad line and thing. And way by before, you never saw that. It was like for everybody, local as well as foreigners, but you no know, thing coming out like foreigners. I'm just saying that us on the beach. You see all them big up? That's the part where all people used to swim and, you know, and suntan up here. They never used to be down that side mostly. It's up here, Silver Sands area. And that's where we hold all our fish on the ground here. So now we have no other choice. They're pushing us back to the mountain and putting the foreigners to the beach. What can we do? Yeah, because after he are done, local wouldn't be able to use up here like before. Because tourists go occupy the beach and then they go out the restriction. The development is good because this was a swamp before, mm -hmm. but now they come and take over the whole beach. Basically, that's what really happening, mm -hmm. you know. And tourism and the government, they need to do something about it. I realize they only checking on the money that going into their pocket and not the well-being of the people. Okay, so this is what we may be talking about here today. Uh, let's go back. Um, so if you want more information about Environmental Fridays, um, again, our website is www.theenvironmentalfridays.com. And um, you could get a lot more information uh, there. One of the things we encourage you to do either after each episode or after, you know, about the series is to give us your thoughts, um, your reaction to the series, and we will put it up on our webpage, on our testimonials webpage. Just send an email to me, murrayd at andrews.edu, and we'll publish some of your thoughts and reactions online. So today, for the first time, I will be calling and saying the words, Mr. Claude J. Douglas. The reason for that is I always call him Joe and he always calls me Desmond. We are cousins, okay? Just to keep uh, this uh, wide and open, transparent. So for today, I'll call him Mr. Claude Douglas. Uh, he is a lecturer in sociology and an immediate past chair of social sciences department at TA Mary Shaw Community College, TAM CC, for the last uh, 10 years. Um, he's a former member of the college's academic board. He's published, he's a self-published author of seven books on the social and political issues in Grenada and the Caribbean. Author, he's also author of two professional articles um, dealing with one, the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Grenada, and that's published in the Encyclopedia of Caribbean Religions. And he also published um, by, he was also published by Cambridge Scholars Press, and that article dealt with the Grenada Revolution and religion. He's a recipient of the Javis Award for Excellence in Sociology. Well, he was at the University of, Virgi of the Virgin Islands in St. Thomas and was named among the university's 50 most influential graduates at its 60th anniversary celebration. And he conducts social impact assessment for a number of environmental scientists and consultants in Grenada. So this is my cousin, Mr. Claude J. Douglas. Very proud of you. So uh, Mr. Douglas will introduce at this time our speaker for today. Um, pleasant good morning again. 
And I want to thank okay. um, Dr. Murray. I'll be referring to him as Dr. Murray for the first time, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I'm happy am I to be part you know, of this Environmental Friday. And, um, when he asked me, you know, my, uh, my forte basically is not the sciences, but the social sciences. And, um, I hesitated a little bit, but um, I gave it consideration and decided that I will be part of this. And so far, I'm enjoying it. You know, but my task this morning is a very simple and very humble one um, to introduce um, my co-fellow Grenadian, who I'm very proud of, you know, uh, having looked, uh, you know, at a um, biographical sketch. I know there might be more to it. But anyway, um, I just want to take this opportunity to introduce the speaker for today, um, Dr. Jody Daniel, is a community and a wetland ecologist interested in how changes in environmental conditions, whether driven by climate or land use activities, affect biological communities. She applies tools and concepts from landscape ecology, community ecology, and geography to investigate how plants, birds, and aquatic microinvertebrates are likely affected by climate and land use. Besides her work in the reassurance industry as data scientist, she is the executive um, director of Gaia Conservation Network in Grenada, a non-governmental organization focused on biological monitoring and citizen science. She holds a bachelor's degree in biology, magna cum laude, from St. George's University, Grenada, a master's uh, degree in natural resources management from the University of Manitoba, Canada, and earned a PhD degree in ecology and environmental biology from the University of Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. So I believe that I believe that um, we are in for a treat today, um, um, looking at the qualification of our speaker and um, also the practical experience that she would have gained um, being part of and a lead player in this non-government organization that deals specifically with the environment. Um, so without any further ado, I want to present to you, um, to us rather, Dr. Judy Daniel. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So, Judy, mm -hmm. you, yep, there you go. Ah, great. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Douglas, for the introduction, and thank you, Dr. Murray, for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> so, today I would really be focusing on um, really um, when we consider environmental conditions and the numerous biological communities we would find in our natural environment, um, how does that conflict, how does that end up conflicting with development? So this is why we're focused on conservation and development. Much of the work I will talk about today is not just my own efforts, but the efforts of many of our contributors who are listed there below. And more recently, if you want to get some more information, particularly on the environmental, economic, as well as cultural heritage impacts of some of the projects I'll be talking about. Um, there's a paper online, um, which um, is all the way in the bottom here. So if you're interested in looking somewhere into that, um, we, we kind of go into a lot more detail there. Um, but this presentation is gonna be broken up somewhat into two separate parts. So the first part of it, I'd be talking about some of the findings we found about these particular really important on coastal ecosystems, what organisms we're seeing there, what does that tell us? And then I'll be going into the implications for this when we consider much of the development that's happening in Grenada currently. So um, I'd be focusing today on mangrove ecosystems. Uh, mangroves are very, very important for migratory birds. So in a mangrove ecosystem, these are coastal wetlands um, and they have treat species. So we typically see three main species associated with them, plant species, 
that would be red, black, and white. And then you have further inland buttonwood, which is not considered to be a true mango species, but you typically find them in mangrove ecosystems. Now, Grenada, as if you may or may not know, many of the islands in the, in the Caribbean, Eastern Caribbean, or just the Caribbean broadly, um, they form a stopover habitat for migratory birds. So whether it is they're going southern or northern, um, as you have changes in seasons, they would stop off in mangrove ecosystems in particular. Um, and so we know that these ecosystems are very, very important for migratory birds. Migratory birds have protections other places in the world. Um, they don't have official protections in Grenada, but these are birds that are global and they just pass, off, pass on in Grenada. And when we lose these, very important mangrove ecosystems, which are coastal wetlands, we are losing habitat for migratory birds. Not just migratory birds, but you also find birds that are almost exclusive, are, are resident to Grenada. So for instance, the Grenada flycatcher, which is found only in Grenada and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, you, we also have observed them there. You also find um, the house wren. Grenada has its own endemic house wren, um, also found in mangrove ecosystems. Um, Broadwing hawks, the Antillean broadwing hawk, a subspecies in Grenada. We also find them in mangroves. So you're not just seeing migratory birds, you're also seeing birds that are resident to the area. So we know that these mangrove ecosystems are super important, and which is why we tend to focus on them. So to pinpoint you to where Grenada is, um, this little spot here, we're very small. Um, but I'll be focusing firstly on some findings we had at four sites on Grenada. So just to give you a better understanding of what we're seeing there. And then, as I said before, we'll transition to talking about what those findings mean for conservation, given the projects that are happening there. So we have two sites, um, one here, two in the south of the island, and then you have another two that are more northern. So we wanted to monitor sites that we hoped would remain around long term, which is questionable at this point. Um, but our thought was we wanted to get um, sites that were kind of distributed along Grenada where you find mangrove habitat. So these are the four sites I'd be talking about here. So the first site, which is the biggest one, it's in the north of the island. It's a Ramsar site. It's the only Ramsar site in Grenada, which means it's a wetland of, of international importance. Um, really, really big wetland. Um, then we have one that is below that. Um, so the one that is in the Northeast of the island conference. Um, this um, mangrove is a bit different from these two mangroves. Sorry, they're separated from the ocean with a beach. They considered to be um, basin mangroves. Um, so we expected them to support some more different organisms than the others. And then in the south of the island, we have two fringing mangroves, and that simply means there is no beach between them. So the water is coming right up on the mangrove, and that's the other side. Um, I'll talk a bit about the activities that's happening there now, but this is just to give you a context of the four sites I'd be talking about first. Um, this may be a bit ecology heavy, but just to focus in here is that we were really interested in what could explain what we see at these different organ um, 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 wetlands. So as I mentioned before, two are basin, which means like there's a beach between them and two are fringing. And one thing in ecology is that we often try to understand what are the factors influencing the organisms we're seeing at a particular site. And the models that typically are applicable when we're talking about these types of sites where they're highly influenced by some environmental condition. And in this case, wetlands are highly influenced by a water gradient or, or the amount of level, long term, level, sorry, the length of time water is present. We're typically looking at the mass effects and patch and species sorting model. So our thought was, if we were to evaluate these sites, would we see support for these things, which are telling us the environmental conditions in that wetland is explaining what's there, or will we see no pattern where no matter the wetland you're looking at, it's, it's somewhat random. We didn't expect that to be the case, but that, that's, that's how we started off. So if we're seeing like some support for the environmental conditions and the positions in the landscape and such, influencing the type of organisms we see there, then we would see that there's strong agreement between their communities. So if we were to do some statistical tests that measure how strongly related the communities are, we would see, we would see evidence for that. We would also expect to see that depending on which wetland we're looking at, there may be differences in the structure of the communities present at those wetlands. And then finally, we would expect to see that if we were to look at, at functional traits, so functional traits are simply referring to um, the type of activity, the type of foraging or type of 
sorry, refers to, let's say, what the organism eats or its behavior or where it nests, all of that information we're talking about these functional traits. We expect to see that there may be a difference among those sites. And if we're seeing evidence for this, we're seeing these wetlands, although they're just repeated mangroves or in Grenada, they do provide value for different type of organisms. And that will mean we should protect them all as much as possible. So we surveyed a lot of things <laughs> as much as we possibly could. So we surveyed birds, we surveyed plants, we surveyed fish, we surveyed um, zooplankton. We even collected stable isotope information, which is simply um, telling us was an attempt for us to understand at the different wetlands are the different um, plants using different water sources. Are we seeing red using more seawater than groundwater? Are we seeing white using more groundwater than seawater? And if we're seeing evidence for that, it would be really helpful when we're trying to restore mangroves. So we're really interested in, in that confidence um, that as well. And we also looked at um, mammals as well. So we had some camera traps set up and then we kept let them out for two weeks and then we came back to see what was there. So but a big team of volunteers, thank you to all of them who really were helpful and useful in collecting these data. So I'll just focus broadly on the plants and the birds because um, that's where we looked more, folk, um, more, more closely. So regardless of the measure we use to um, um, look at plant composition, so basal area referring to how um, big the tree is, canopy with which is telling you how wide the canopy itself is, and tree height, which is simply telling how tall the tree is, if you were to use any of those as proxies for the structure of a plant community, they were strongly in agreement with birds. So which is telling us that the birds that are there are highly influenced by the plants that are there, which is really valuable. So black birds are really, plants are really be, are influencing birds, and that's, that's what we understand to be. Mm -hmm. um, this plot might be a bit confusing, but I just would um, show you what I'd like you to take away. So those big circles are ellipses and they are color coded for each site. So um, if an ellipse is tighter, it means that that site is um, more tighter in its composition. And if it's wider, it means that it's overlapping on a lot of sites. But what we did see is one of those sites in the south, which is West Hall in yellow, that site was put a standout site from the other. And you can see that Mount Hartman and West Hall, which were the two, um, they're, they're, they're considered to be um, fringe and mangroves, so the seeds coming up on them. They, um, they were really tight in terms of the composition of plants there. So again, more evidence for their values. And if we were to look specifically at the um, bird plant association, so now we're looking, these spots, these dots here represent a different site. And what we're trying to do is see if certain birds are more associated with certain sites and look at that particularly from the behavior of the birds. So if you look particularly at the figure down here, we'd see that um, in, in blue, which is Lavera, we're seeing most of this, I told you, which is a big site, we're seeing almost all the birds. Birds that like lakes and ponds, birds, birds that like forests, birds that like marshes, birds that sometimes are associated with oceans and at open woodland also found there. And if we go over here, we're seeing also many of the birds are associated there. So we're seeing the birds that dive to eat. We see dabblers are birds that would see on top of the water and then throw their heads in to get, get their food. So that site in the north had a, a relatively strong association. But one thing I thought was really interesting was that site in the south, which has a lot of activity happening right now. We only have two sites for there. But we're seeing what we would expect. And this is grasslands. And one thing we're seeing here is that birds who are, those birds that are often migratory, are often labeled as grassland birds. And we're seeing that many of them are associated with that Mount Hartman site. So the site, maybe in the south of the island, may not be as big as Livera, but those birds who are typically the ones that walk and then throw their heads into this, throw their heads into the, um, the soil to eat insects, we're typically seeing them in that very small site in the south. So that is telling us that while um, the plants are being influenced, the birds are influenced by the plants, we are seeing that some sites may have a strong associates with some birds and yet so more evidence to protect it. Um, I'll, I'll move ahead here from the birds and plants to then tell you about some of the dominant things we saw with the plants. So generally we saw that among all the sites, red was the most dominant species. So red is the one you typically see in the water. Um, so mostly, sorry, white is the most dominant species. Um, and also saw, we also saw that 
um, when we look at the water sources that the plants are using, at each site, regardless of the site, red is using the same water source, black is using the same water source, white is using the same water source. So that is telling us that if you have come to a site and you see a lot of white or a lot of black or a lot of red, if you disrupt that water flow, you're going to have a very big impact on the plants. And if you have a very big impact on the plants, you're gonna have a very big impact on the birds. So, um, here, I'd just like to mention, we saw a lot of different birds. Um, so we're seeing birds as I show here. This is a nice little green heron here. Um, we're seeing um, laughing gulls. We're seeing smooth bill annies. So this bird here is a wetland bird. This bird here is a wetland bird. But this bird here, these are also wetland birds here. But then we have a little banana quid here, which isn't. So as I mentioned before, you're going to these sites, you're not just seeing birds that use the wetland, you're also finding birds that are typically terrestrial. Um, this plot here is just showing you like the, how frequent some of the species are. So <laughs> you may not know about birds in Grenada, but this is um, a Grenada flycatcher here, only found in Grenada and St. Vincent, we're finding a lot of them in conference. Um, the Antillian crested hummingbird, which a bird is really, really tiny, but the hummingbird also found them a lot in Mount Hopland, as well as the Grenada, the, um, the Grenada morph um, banana quit. So the banana quits all around the world, Grenada has, and St. Vincent has a special one that's fully black. Also finding them a lot in these wetlands as well. But moving on again, some notes on some other groups we saw is that when we survey the mammals, we were seeing that generally, um, we're seeing, if you go to the coast of the edge of the wetland, you're seeing a lot of mammals. And you might ask, why is that a concern? Birds in particular are super um, sensitive to the presence of mammals because many of them are predators, so like mongoose and cats. So if you end up in a situation where you are segmenting a wetland or you're cutting it up or you're building a road through it, you're making it much easier for these mammals to stick with birds. As I mentioned before, you don't just have migratory birds that you have resident birds there. So if you're making it easier for the, for the mammals, you're making it harder for the birds that nest there. It means that their chance of survival is lower. And we do know that the, one of the leading causes of bird mortality when in nesting is actually mom predation. So which has strong implications for the projects I'll talk about next. Another thing too we observed is that there was evidence that the endemic and critically endangered um, bird, which is a Grenada dove, was found around that Manhattan, Manhattan wetland, which has activity happening now. So although you may have, this bird may not necessarily be found directly in the wetland, it's using areas close to it. So if you have development activities happening, you're not just impacting these migratory birds or these resident birds, you're also impacting one of the rarest birds in the world where there are 200 and fewer than 250 individuals. And the final thing I'd mention on the ecology of this is that when we looked at the fish in particular, we saw that there are at least 20 different species of fish using the, the natural ecosystems to these wetlands. So, and many of these fish were the same fish you would find that these local fishermen in the area are harvesting. So when we talk to fishermen in Woburn, for instance, or even in Westall, they're saying that these species that we are finding in these wetlands in their juvenile stage are the same species that they are catching which has consequences. So if you lose these wetlands, you're not just impacting birds, you're not just impacting plants or zooplankton, you're also impacting people's livelihoods because many of them act as an issue for these fish. So I talked a lot about the ecology to give you con um, um, some context on the fact that the, the plants and the birds highly influence each other. When we degrade these habitats, um, many of these, these community structures fall apart. We leave these ecosystems really vulnerable but it's not just going to impact us, people who just care about the environment broadly, but they also impact for um, our local fisheries as well. And many of these people are relying as on fisheries as their main source of income. So this brings us into the conversation around coastal development, which is really what I would like to hone on here. Um, these mangrove ecosystems, they are very much under threat due to coastal development. And there are three projects I can highlight here. So the one in the south of the island where the Grenada Dove, which is critically endangered, is found. There's a plan for, it's not too clear now, but it may be a university, maybe a mega resort, it's unclear. The plans have changed. Um, 
we also see uh, another sixth sense tell happening um, to the east of that, where we initially had selected that site for monitoring, but because of coastal development, the entire mangrove was basically cut down. Um, and that particular site was really valuable for birds, and I'll talk a bit more about that. And then you have one in the north of the island where that liver, a big wetland was talking about, that wetland that is a Ramsar that you're finding all of these diverse birds present. There is a plan for a 17 story hotel with, I don't remember how many holes, golf courses, golf course, but that is what's planned for that area. So again, of the four sites we selected for surveying, two of them are under threat. The one of them we had initially selected is now gone. So while these are very important ecosystems, we have a lot of conflict in use for development. So to give you some history of the context about this one of the sites, I mentioned one of the sites in Tam Angles was gone. Um, so this first point into you that um, the mangrove forest was destroyed by February 2022. Um, this is a coastal forest you removed after here. Um, my screen went weird. Are you still able to see my screen? Um, so this is just giving you some context of what the site looked like before. So this is a picture we took at, of the site during dry season. It fluctuates in water a lot. Um, that's what the site looked like. Um, it supported diverse, it was probably one of the most, I would say functionally diverse wetlands and we lost the entire thing falling. So if you look at the picture on the right, this is what that area looks like now. So that one's very <laughs> luscious mangroves now the, the pond has been dredged a bit. They're putting some artificial island. Most of the vegetation has been removed. So in that area, we found, based on some surveys we've done and others have done, they found 10 different families of fish. We know that both Hawksville and green sea turtles use this area. So the bay right here, we typically find green sea turtles and they're foraging on seagrass on the turtle, what we call turtle grass there. And then oftentimes in a back beach, uh, uh, Sorry, my laser is moving very slow. The back beach is where we find hawksbill turtles coming up. So hawksbill turtles, when they're nesting, they're looking for areas with dense vegetation, which you can see this area once had. And we see evidence that as they come up now, there's actually tracks there and you can't find out that you need in order to nest. So we've already lost all of this. Um, so this is just a recent video we found. Um, just at the site itself. So what's been happening here is that they have decided to a hope it plays. So what's happening here at the site is that they um, are creating an outlet between the pond and the sea, and they are expanding the beach and blocking access to it, which is technically con uh, an issue of consideration because um, under Grenada's Integrated Coastal Development Act, that is not something that's allowable. Um, based on reviews of a marine study submitted by the developers, they did suggest that they should not put the outlet there. Um, so it's interesting that the outlet is going in the exact same spot that a recommendation suggested it shouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, but one bigger issue is that there are critically endangered Elkhorn coral in that bay. There's vast sea, um, vast seagrass beds and a wide abundance of fish. So the thought is if you're gonna have a lot of brackish water coming in from the pond into the area, you're going to vastly impact the seagrass beds because increasing sedimentation lowers their productivity, causes more coral bleaching and the consequences are very vast. So um, in addition to the impacts on all the biota that the removal of the mangrove had, we know are going to have brackish water coming directly into a bay that didn't historically have that proportion of it coming in. Now we go to the one at the, the site at the north of the island. So we have in Lavera, so we have some forest. Um, they put some temporary worker housing in there um, before the planning, full, full planning permission was given, um, on a, but they were given permission to do so. The total forest on the threat is over there. And then we have the mango forest on the threat. And in this particular area, there are really diverse birds, as I mentioned before, at least 14 different families of fish, 13 species of coral. Leather, um, this beach, Lavera Beach, is considered to be the most, one of the largest nesting sites for leatherback turtles on the island. 
And the proposed development, which includes a 19-story building, will include lights, which may make it nearly impossible for the turtles to come up. There's also a proposed golf course. And we've seen from prior developments, there have been many developments in this area. Um, there was, you can see an increase in sedimentation coming down to the beach, which means the sand gets too cakey and the turtles are not able to nest. So even if <laughs> the sedimentation doesn't get there, you know, have issues with the lights. You see some of the proposals are within the wetland themselves. Um, massive changes in hydrology. And as I mentioned before, if you change the hydrology of a site, you're going to change which plants are there. If you change which plants are there, you're going to affect which birds are there. Mm. Uh, and then not added to the noise and noise you know does have an impacts on biota um, so it makes it difficult more difficult for them to communicate so we're adding a lot of stressors to this area which, which is supposed to be a wetland of international importance mm. and then the final one i'll talk about would be the site in the south of the island where the critically endangered grenada dove is so we had some vegetation that was moved in 2020 we had some additional forest moved again later that year this is a total forest on the threat this is a mangrove forest on, on the threat. Um, but I should mention that the mangrove on the other side in green has already seen impact. So they removed a lot of that vegetation. So in the case of Mount Hartman on the left, this is a picture in 2014. Notice there are no roads <laughs> in this area. Um, the, the roads, any tracks that were there were pretty small. It was more, more footpaths and very, very, very tiny. And now by July, 2020, we have these massive, um, the headland is now gone. So why are we concerned about this is because we do know that Grenada doves have been found, breeding pairs have been found on this headland right next to the wetland. So we've already lost habitat. And again, as I mentioned, this bird is critically endangered. There are fewer than 250 individuals left in the world. And this is where one of their subpopulations are found. So you've seen a level of large scale development that's happened already. Roads have been widened, forests have been moved. This area has now changed really vastly and now we're not just infecting our local biota, but now these migratory birds are not going to be able to use these areas as before. And as I mentioned before, we now have a lot of big roads and roads, mongoose love roads. So this just makes the area more vulnerable to predation. In the picture in the bottom, you'd see the proposed development. Um, <laughs> so you can see what's going to happen there this happened but that is going to be vastly changed if this project happens. So the wetlands are nearly have big structures within them. The hydrology is completely changed. The footprint of this habitat is crazy large. You will lose grenaded of habitat, and then you have the additional pressures that it puts on whatever habitat is remaining. Um, so this is just a video from July of what it is. It's just a drone shot we had of what was happening in July. So, Again, don't with the initial picture I showed you, there was no vegetation there to, to worry about, but then now you see a lot has changed, a lot has been removed. And that area where you're seeing their building is where that Grenada, Grenada doves were using. And they also cut some of the wetland out. So <laughs> no, any birds that are using the middle there are no vulnerable to predators. Um, and it's going to be completely changed based on the designs. So, um, I can tell you obviously that there can be economic impacts of a loss of this habitat. So this is just comparing the size of these habitats and area. Um, this is the value of ecosystem services that are, um, the, 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 sorry, the amount of carbon storage sequentization we're losing for tons per year. And then finally here, we're looking at um, the value of the mangrove ecosystems lost. So the idea with ecosystem services is that these ecosystems are providing some goods, some services to us that we aren't able to replicate, like water filtration. Um, and so by losing this habitat, we're actually causing some indirect effects on our economy when we lose these, these ecosystems. And note that Grenada is a small island. We are very sensitive to the impacts of climate change and sea level rise. And so when we're losing this coastal habitat, we're leaving ourselves very, 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 very vulnerable. And we can't replicate the services that these ecosystems are providing. But something I'd also like to highlight too is that it's not just economic or ecological impacts or even livelihood impacts. We have cultural heritage impacts. Um, based on work by Dr. Jonathan Hanna, we are aware that there's a strong relationship between these coastal 
habitats or wetlands generally, and where we tend to find artifacts associated with Grenada's indigenous people. So wetlands are forming time capsules into Grenada's history. So if we are going to destroy these habitats and we're not even excavating them properly, which we are not, we are losing a lot of historical information. This is a, um, an example of a burial found at one of the sites. Um, and I think a more recent work, and I have to, I may be wrong, recent work suggests that there are a mix of um, African as well as indigenous burials um, on that, in that Lassages area. So they're not being properly excavated. We lose these ecosystem services. We also lose a lot about Grenada's um, history because these burials tell us a lot about behaviors of Grenada's indigenous people and what was happening in the past. So people have attempted to do things about this. We've attempted to have consultations with the developers, um, physical planning directly, which were not necessarily as successful as we hoped. So we've gotten sight of some of the VIVs, which we've read. Um, some of them, um, some of them had instances where the developers ignored the recommendations of their own EIAs. Um, there were poor calls for public consultation. Um, um, Mr. Douglas might be fully aware because he works a lot with EIAs, but you're supposed to do a lot of community consultation with this. And from what we've seen you know, of the little EIAs we've seen, that many of them do not do community consultation. Many of the pe people in the community do not hear about these projects until after the fact. And we don't even ask the community, do you want an 18-story hotel in your backyard? Do you want a 16-story hotel? Um, this is not conversations that happen. We just throw these things up and say, we'll, we'll, we'll get some money for it. So consultation with community members are very lim lim minimal. And mm -hmm. now you're having issues with access to beaches and beach access is supposed to be public in Grenada. Mm -hmm. None of these things are really addressed because we don't have the consultations. Um, so we've also asked physical planning for project approvals. Because technically when somebody gets a project approved, there should be conditions. Um, in the past, there was an EIA committee that reviewed these environmental impact assessments. Um, and from those assessments, they would be given to developers, okay, we actually can't give you an approval because here are the things you need to address. Or they may say, we will give you an approval, but here are the things you need to um, do. All of this is done behind closed doors and many times to get information in the past on what was the pro pro project plan and approval process is very difficult. So if a, if a developer is supposed to do a particular intervention, we don't know. Um, if that was requesting of them, so we never knew why we did So then where this thing currently is, it's currently at the point of being at a, a judicial review. So a judicial review is simply a legal, legal matter is, a, is, is, is taking this action to court and acts in the court um, to ask the authority to revisit their decision. So asking the authority, these approvals you gave we think that it didn't take good consideration of the environmental and social impacts. Um, there aren't sufficient mitigation measures, so please ask the, 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 the planning authority to review, it, review them. Um, currently, the project, the judge um, uh, made, um, heard some arguments in last year, um, and this was about the Grenada government, um, joined by all three developers, um, were, were saying the organization that took the legal action doesn't have legal standing to bring the case. And the judge decided that he will make that decision when a substantive matter is heard. The developers and the government of Grenada did not agree, so they took it to the Court of Appeal. So the Court of Appeal last heard this in September, and they reserved judgment, which means they're going to release their um, ruling hopefully soon. But within that almost two year process, these projects have continued to go ahead um, with little mitigation interventions for what, they're, what, what the consequences of them can be. And I should mention that in this case, it's not asking, it's not an anti-development case, anti-hotel um, development case, but it's saying that if you're going to approve these things, we should do due process. We should ensure that mm -hmm. adequate mitigation of measures. We should also ensure that this is something the community wants in the first place. And the scale should match the environment. So we shouldn't put more than an entire wetland and just put a mega resort on top of it. Because again, you will have issues in the future. Um, this is just some of the organizations that have banded together on this um, to really help advocate for 
better management of, of, of Grenada's natural resources and lands because we understand that the impacts are not just on the ecology, which is where my knowledge area is. There are cultural implications, there are economic implications, there is access and implications. We know that individuals um, have a stronger sense of well being when they're in an environment that is more treed and more natural. So um, there's just ongoing advocacy happening. Um, and many groups are concerned about it. I should mention that a lot of the ecology work we did um, was supported by Environment, Environment and Climate Change Canada. And so that is how we were able to do all of that baseline research in the first place. Um, and so I've come down to the, to the end and I'm sorry that I didn't end on, a, on an extremely positive note, um, but this is just some co um, contact information. Um, I should mention that one of the, the organization that took this legal matter up, the Grenada Land Actors, they have reached out to the new government. Grenada had a change in government in June. Um, they've done some writing to physical planning. They've tried to reach out to government ministers to ask for better advocacy, ask for better mitigation strategies, but more so, there's so much policy that we don't, we don't have regulations for. Um, and asking them to do what, what needs to happen to ensure that there's better oversight. So um, at this point, all we can do is hope, but the legal matter is still ongoing. Um, so if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Very good, very good. Joe? Oh, doc, Mr. Doug. Thank you so much. Uh, very, very, very informative um, presentation. And, and at times, I should see unintentionally vixen. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. So do you have a question? By the a scope. Yeah. So at this time, um, are there any questions for Dr. Daniel? Well, I mean, my question right off the bat, I have two. One is who benefits from the development? And is there no accountability? Accountability in terms of like, I mean, Grenada is a democracy. So if the government is in cahoots or however you want to say that with developers and it's not what the people want, mm -hmm. shouldn't the people also have a say at the ballot box and held mm -hmm. the politicians accountable? I don't know. I'm just putting those two out there right now. Well, I can say I'm um, Mr. Douglas may have more insights on that since he's more on a social mm -hmm. scientist side. But well, I, there was me... a there mm -hmm. was a change in government recently. Mm -hmm. Um and so this is a reason why there have been many attempts to write to each of the new ministers from mm -hmm. planning to um environment, fisheries, forestry, because these are the ones with oversight over these things, right? But we haven't had um a response. Um we've got acknowledgement and plans to meet but nothing really nothing's really come out of that and mm. and i would say um i think one of the frustrating parts of it is that many people see when you're raising these concerns as being anti-development and um, they mm. say you know grenada has an mm. a need to increase our hotel stock so we need more hotels and so because we need more hotel because we need more rooms then we're justified in these projects and these projects are also tied to grenada's citizen by, by investment program which mm. i think I think it's 100,000 US um, in order to get a Grenadian passport. I could be wrong on that amount. And then that money goes into fund these projects. Mm -hmm. um, we are not, I'm not sure as to why the model is that you, the passport money, whether or not, however, we feel about CVI, <laughs> I am not sure why the money goes into hotel development at that scale. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, to me, it could go into to fix roads, to fund schools, but we've, decided we're going to use them to, to build hotels. And I'm not against building hotels. It's just that if you look at the hotel that they're planning in Lavera, for instance, it's a 
16 story, 16 story hotel. Grenada is nothing that tall. 16 story hotel in the north of the island. It can take you an hour and a half or two hours to get to that part of the island. The road infrastructure may not be able to support it. The water infrastructure, may not, it's, it's, the scale does not necessarily match the landscape. And considering that this area was proposed for a marine protected area, the question is why something so large in such a it's such a in such an ecologically sensitive area. So no one is against development, but the argument is we need more hotel rooms, people could get jobs. Um, and I don't think people are aware of the intricacies of sometimes what these projects come with. Okay, let me just butt in here before um, there's a raised hand. Um, Patricia, if I may refer to you. Mm -hmm. That's um, I, I want to add that there is this lack of what I call it logical consciousness in Grenada, you know, and uh, that leads to a blatant disregard, you know, for the environment. Okay. And as Dr. Daniel um, correctly pointed out, that anytime you um, start acting, you know, as protector of the environment, um, your action basically is considered anti-development, you know, and um, especially by the powers, the powers that be, you know, um, and what is taking place in Grenada, similar to a documentary, I don't know how many of you, um, I was privileged to have seen a documentary on Jamaica, I call it Jamaica for sale, you know, um, is it along the same line. So I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to make that contribution that, you know, there is this lack of, of um, ecological. I don't think the powers that be understand the importance of the environment and the relationship between the environment and man. I don't think they quite understand that and how um, protecting and preserving the environment could really, you understand, me, add value, you know, to what they are doing, the very same um, tourism development, among other things. All right. So... We have a hand, um, Patricia Maga, I hope I have the, the, the pronunciation correct. Yes, um, Patricia Maga is the name. And yes. I am from Trinidad and Tobago. I just want to know, really, do you carry out other um, social and environmental impact assessments carried out that are properly publicly advertised? before any of these developments take place. Um, the scale of these developments is very disturbing and it looks to me as if they really will almost um, finish up by killing the goose that lays the golden egg mm -hmm. because you will be destroying precisely what you're trying to portray when for a, from a tourism point of view and attracting tourists to, to Grenada. So is the environmental impact, they, they do carry out environmental, social and economic impact assessments before any development is allowed to take place, is that correct? And you do have building codes? Yeah, um, yes. Um, so I'm trying not to pitch too much of my opinion too. I'm um, temperate <laughs> as much as I can. Um, yes, uh, when you have these projects, technically you're supposed to have an environmental impact assessment because of the scale. Mm -hmm. The problem I've been seeing is, is that in some cases, if you get hands of the EIA, which is a problem, getting access to the EIA has been a historical problem. Mm -hmm. If your area of expertise is, say, wetlands or you're a marine biologist, you may notice some that the terms of reference of the EIA and then what was produced, they don't match. And oftentimes the EIA itself didn't really do public consultation or you're supposed to do consultation. Um, if they did, it, it barely scratches the surface. And when it comes to the environmental assessments they do, sometimes they, they tell they're saying things like, this is based on the landscape designs. So the developer has this hypothetical design that has barely any information and the EIA practitioner is supposed to make recommendations when it's not very clear what they're really going to do. So it's not very, it, it, it's very hard based on what, from some of the years I've read. I mean, 
it's very hard to know how are you going to do an adequate EIA based on these designs. But secondly, the EIA feels as just a document they do to pass it along. There and, and then the developers, and even if you have the best thoroughly done EIA, there is no guarantee that the developer is going to follow the recommendations of their own EIA. And physical planning, it does not do monitoring. So it means if the EIA is set to put sediment traps in the water, there is no guarantee it will be there because nobody read the no one is putting that as a tool. So the EIAs themselves have to just become a thing you have to do. And we've been seeing evidence of developers using breaking up their project into phases and then using the same EIA to cover all the phases, but they change the plans in between. The case in the Mount Hartman one, they're using an EIA from 2016 and the project has changed. So, mm. sorry, it's so ranty. Yes, there are EIAs, but there are so much concerns. With the regulations or any that sounds as if that is the major problem but apart from that do they not build penalties into the that if the grants if they accept the eia do they then not build in penalties that costs that if they don't adhere to them it seems as if your legal framework is sadly lacking Agreed, it is sadly lacking. Grenada has a new Physical Planning Act 2016. They have not put any regulations attached to it. So any regulations in the Physical Planning Act, we're relying on the earlier act, which I think is 2002. The Minister of Environment is supposed to, it's the act, so the Minister of Planning is supposed to put regulations around this. But that was since 2016. And I don't know if, I don't know if it's intentional that we don't have any regulations around EIAs and we're forced to rely partially on a 2002 Act, um, which is the things that we've been asking government to do. Please put regulations. Also, you've signed on to ESCASU agreement. Please ratify it. And ESCASU would say, you should be doing much better with public consultation. So there are some legal gaps, as you mentioned. So, yes, has Grenada signed the Escazio agreement? Yes, but we haven't ratified it. Okay. So, so it seems then to the answer to one of my questions is there is really no accountability at any level. People are pretty much doing what they want to do. Um, no penalty or minimal penalty. There is no accountability in terms of the political uh, structure like you know, if they're not doing right, you vote them out. That's not working because it seems like everybody is just no accountability is, is seems to be the, the thing. So the, the other question is who benefits? I mean, I pretty much know the answer, but <laughs> <laughs> like if you're doing development, so-called, is it for the people or for... Mm, who benefits? And good question. To me, I don't, I, I can't, um, there is who they say benefit, um, but the question is who actually benefits is, is I, I can't say, I mean, I guess maybe some people get some jobs and from what we've known, many of the jobs are lower paying jobs in hotels, which are sometimes very seasonal. So um, yeah, good question. I. <laughs> Yeah, who benefits is a good question. I can't tell you who benefits from this because I can't think of the average thinking yeah. about Grenada's generation to come or not benefiting from this. I should mention legally we under the Museum Act, there is legal, it, it does have legislation about Grenada's artifacts. So technically, if you're a developer and you come across artifacts or you know their artifacts, you're supposed to stop. <laughs> the museum is supposed to come in. Mm -hmm. So we do have some, but again, these things are not followed. So, and, um, so I might say uh, that it also depends on, on the developer, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I remember some years ago, we um, a, a building at our college, that's the TM Irish Community College, basically, um, had to be built. Um, but in that very same area, we had about four or five mahogany trees. You know, and the Caribbean Development Bank asked <laughs> this is an important question. What are we going to do with those trees? Right? And um, the and the response was that we have to remove them. And uh, they also counter with, uh, but if you have to remove them, uh, then the building cannot be built. You know, so it depends, it depends on the organization. 
Um, but if you have, you know, uh, these kind of people, I'm saying these kind of people that are coming to Grenada, you know, especially in the in the tourism sector, and don't care about, about and the environment, because most of them lately really don't care. You know, you, you look at the responses um, to people and organizations, you know, like um, Judy's organizations, you know, and other environmental um, minded organizations, yeah. Um, and there is just disregard, you know, we mm. come here to make money and that's what we are here for. So don't get into our way, you know, um, in terms of preventing us from making money, you know, and the government basically think that it is more ex politically expedient, you know, um, in terms of the so-called job creation and, and those things. Uh, but in the long run, as was pointed out, you know, by Dr. Daniel, um, because we, we are destroying because there is no sustainable development in what they are doing. Right. Okay, the man who will be gone after a period of time. Um, in the very same way that the coastal um, erosion would have dis um, destroyed most of our um, beaches on the on the east on the east coast. You know, the government was busy providing um, these roads, um, concrete built roads, um, not taking into consideration that the impact that it would have had on the environment. And today, um, the East Coast, a uh, uh, five-mile stretch, uh, approximately, between what we call the telescope point and the La Poultry Rock, uh, acres, acres of land. You know, the sea has, has consumed acres. Uh, when I'm talking about acres, I'm talking about real acres of land. And, and that's the price of development in Grenada. The price is much higher. The cost is much higher. Um, than the short-term benefits that these mm -hmm. investors are actually coming to, to, to have. Yeah. So mm -hmm. is there any effort to, by the government or by NGOs, non-governmental organizations, to basically identify two things? One, areas that could be sustainably developed and areas that should be development of any type should be really not undertaken. Um, is there any sort of thing like that? Because it seems to me like those sort of things should be worked out. So it's not up to the developer coming in to say, oh, I want to develop here. No, the government and the people of Grenada should, should say, these are the different areas around our country that you could you could sustainably develop. Um, and if you don't agree, well, you know, move on. Is there that sort of effort? Or am I too idealistic here? I think I was just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was just going to say that's a lot of idealism. Yeah. <laughs> that, you, that you are projecting here because um, you see, that 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 the, the party the, the politics that is really really getting into the way of these things. So even if people uh, may want to object, um, there is this there is this um, what I call political intervention, you know, <laughs> by, uh, by politicians basically um, to ride up those people, the supporters and what have you, um, to see what. You know, the environmentalists are actually talking about. That's why public consultation, most environmental public consultation in Grenada, most of them are poorly attended, mm -hmm. right? Poorly, poorly attended, you know? And, um, and it has to do one with the lack of knowledge of people about the environment, you know, that, that, that um, lack of consciousness, they are not very conscious about it. And most times when there is an opportunity to become conscious, um, there is this political, um, what they call interference. Mm. You know, I've seen it in the past where the politicians will come and um, we label people like Judy um, as anti developers, you know, and, and those things. So um, it's, it's really an uphill task, mm. really an uphill task in Grenada because, you know, of the politics of the development. Okay, okay. Does anyone else have questions? So we're getting close to the end, but if there are a couple of more questions, we could take them or comments. 
I should add, when it comes to the Grenada has a blue growth master plan that they did. I don't know who was part of the consultation for the blue growth master plan. So I find the recommendations in there crazy mm -hmm. to me. But some of them, they're all things that would consistently proposing some of these environmentally vulnerable areas as, as for development. Um, mm -hmm. In the case of Moon Hotman, I don't think, again, I'm not particularly angry at the developers because at the end of the day, they do what we allow them to do. Right. Um, as yeah. it's our responsibility to ensure that due process is done. Mm -hmm. Livera has had numerous instances of field projects. This is not the first time our government is offering up these areas for, for development. And it's the same with Mount Hartman. This is not the first time we've offered up these spaces for development. I don't understand why we choose these areas that people say are vulnerable, are important to us as Grenadians, as areas we're going to put. And it's not that we're going to put some eco lodges. If it was an eco lodge, just a different conversation. We mm -hmm. put these massive footprint projects. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't make sense for the type of project with the environment you're placing it with your children. If you're building where in an ecologically sensitive area, if you're choosing to do that, we should not be putting a 16 hole hotel, 18 stories, that should not be part of the conversation at all. So it's a mystery to me. <laughs> yeah. So are you finding any sort of like hope and common cause with mm -hmm. other groups? Because I think I saw you listed in one of your last slides because that's, you know, it's going to take a while. But if if you are, you know, forming those sort of collaborations with others, um, not only uh, in Grenada, but throughout the Caribbean, not only throughout the Caribbean, but globally, um, eventually, okay, is we're going to have to be patient, I guess, because it will take <laughs> awareness, education, you know, everything. A lot of things have to align for the, a different trend to, to occur. So are you, are you at least see some positive um, and hopeful signs in um, collaborations that you are involved with? Yeah, I definitely think that we, from, I really started on just purely ecology, environmental monitoring side and ended up in connection with people who are more on the advocacy side. So the advocacy side is not necessarily my area of focus is with ecology, mm -hmm. um, but I have found that there are people who are concerned about these causes, these, these impacts, and have really, it's interesting, I find that individuals who are sometimes close to retirement age, when I think they've had a bit more wisdom, <laughs> <laughs> um, or sometimes the ones we find who are saying, y'all don't understand the impact of the trend we're on, the trajectory we're on is not good. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just individuals who may be young, but I think people of the first ages are recognizing that we yeah. have to do better. Yeah. And not just in Grenada, we've had conversations with people other parts of the region in Antigua, conversations with people in Bonaire, people in Jamaica, who are all Bahamas, who are facing the exact same issues, issues where we're not thinking long-term about the way we develop. We are mm. small islands. We're not like in the US, yeah. they destroy 10 acres of land and, and just throw it over. We destroy 10 acres of land. That's mm. a lot of land. So the, the consequences of poor planning in Grenada are, to me, much more impactful. So it's kind of helpful that we have other people who are thinking similarly. OK. I, I saw Ms. Um, Margot again, Patricia. Yes, I was just thinking. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, this is horrifying, but mm -hmm. also when these hotel complexes go in, do they have a sort of social uh, responsibility? Do they interact with the people in the area or do they run these all-inclusive resorts sort of things, which would make it even worse? Mm-hmm. Uh, again, I have I, I, I've, I've come across developers who, to my opinion, are not, they say they're concerned about community involvement, but they're not, because when you put them to task and you say, let's do consultation, let's include people, here are the concerns people have about beach access. All of a sudden, conversations are on community consultation. Mm -hmm. so I don't believe that they are interested in community consultation. If they were, they wouldn't develop the way they do. They would develop very differently. It wouldn't be because people started making noise 
friends on Facebook and they're reacting. It would be when we started this development, we went to the community, we talked to them about what our plans are, and they were along with us along the way. And our design reflects that, but that's not the way we're developing here. And again, I can't fully blame the developers. It's we allow them to do that as Grenadians. Mm -hmm. We have authorities like physical planting, we have forestry, we have fisheries, you have government agencies whose responsibilities oversaw oversee the, the sustainable management of our resources. And I think that we are failing Grenadians because we are not doing a good job. I mean, I don't work there personally, but I say mm -hmm. collectively, we are failing ourselves because mm -hmm. we allow them to do it. Yeah. All right. Well, I uh, want to thank you, Dr. Daniel, for a very good conversation and information. And um, hope that things would start trending in a different direction. It will take um, a lot of work, a lot of patience. Um, we know this, but hopefully working together with others, not just in Grenada, because there are people around the Caribbean, there are organizations around the Caribbean that are, as you know, doing work uh, in your field and trying to build awareness um, and trying to, you know, get a, a middle ground between um, us just ignoring our environment and, and undergoing instead uh, sustainable development. It's, you know, it's not that any one of us are against development, mm -hmm. but we definitely want it so that the future um, generations will be still able to benefit from Grand Anne's and spend time there without, you know, all these uh, concerns. I want to thank my co-host. Mm -hmm. I want to thank everyone um, who came on here today. And um, we look forward to, again, seeing you and hearing from you next week. This video will also be put up on YouTube. And so everyone will have a chance to take a look at it at their leisure. Thank you so very much again, Dr. Daniel and Mr. Claude J. Douglas. Thank you all. <laughs> take care. Thank you so much for the opportunity. All right. Thank take you. care. All right. Bye-bye. For more information about our sponsors and partners, please visit the Environmental Friday's Partners and Sponsors page. Be sure to visit our website at www.theenvironmentalfridays.com.